I want to pick up in uh, Ask about in the chapter Mooney, Wormtail, Padfoot, and Prongs. Because I want to try and finish uh, Azkaban, I'm going to say rather quickly, and it'll probably be the entire period. <clears throat> Sirius tells Harry, Ron, and Hermione that Scabbers is actually an animagus by the name of Peter Pettigrew. And Ron gives what I think of as the typical Ron Weasley attitude or, or response. You're mental. You're crazy. Harry says, Pettigrew's dead. He killed him 12 years ago. He says, no, I meant to, but little Peter got the better of me. All right? So they continue talking, and Lupin says, okay, you know, serious, they need to understand. That is, you've got to allow them to, to understand what really happened and why and how. Okay? And Hermione says, but Scabbers can't be Pettigrew. It, it, it can't be true. Page 351. And Lupin says, why? Why can't it be true? Gee, well, people would know. I mean, there's a registry for Anna Magi. She says, I, I looked it up. You know. What does Hermione believe? What? Everyone follows the rules. Okay, everyone follows the rules. What else? Yeah, if it's not in a book, it can't be true. There's a book in the ministry that says who the Animagi are. If they're not listed there, then therefore it cannot be true that so-and-so is an Animagi. Okay. And he says, you're right, but the ministry never knew there were three unregistered Animagi. Black, you know, come on, get to the point. Let's hurry it along. I've waited 12 years for this. I'm going to kill the dirty little. <clears throat> Ron goes on and talks about the place being haunted. He says, not haunted. He says, that was me. Okay, Lupin explains why he would come down there. That Dumbledore allowed him to come to school and such. Page 354. He says, my three friends could hardly fail to notice that I disappeared once a month. I made up all sorts of stories, but they worked it out, too, that I was a werewolf. He says, instead, what did they do? They became animagi. Harry, my dad, too. What did Ollivander tell Harry about his father's wand? Good for transfiguration work. Yes, indeed. It took them the best part of three years to work out how to do it. Your father and Sirius here were the cleverest students in the school. Lucky they were, because Animage's transformation can go horribly wrong. Okay. Finally, in our fifth year, they managed it. Okay. Fifth year. Hermione, but how did that help? They could keep me company. They couldn't keep me company as humans. Why? Because the world would go after humans. But apparently werewolves don't go after stags and big black dogs. Keep in mind, you know, when Sirius turns into a big black dog, he's not a big black dog. He's a big black dog, okay? Think like an Irish wolfhound, which stands about that high at the shoulder. And then put it on steroids, maybe, okay? So Remus, hurry up, says, um, hurry up, Remus, says Black. He's on. Just chill out. He says, Sirius and James transformed into large animals. They were able to keep a werewolf in check. And what did Peter transform into? A rat. <laughs> Not much good at keeping a werewolf in check. Okay. And Lupin says, you know, so what did we do? When they transformed and I was a werewolf... We ran around. Hermione, well, that was really dangerous, running around in the dark with a werewolf. What if you'd given the others slip? And he goes, yeah, that's, I think about that. In other words, what does that show us about James and Sirius? Bad influences? What else? How about carefree? They don't really care about rules. Rules are for the lesser mortals. 
when it comes to um, James and Sirius. Okay? They talk about Snape. And lo and behold, Snape shows up. And Snape would really like take care of Sirius Black right then and there. And Harry finally has enough with Snape on page 361. Because what has Harry done? Snape's got his wand out, and Harry goes and blocks the door. Get out of the way, Potter, page 360. You're in enough trouble already. Okay. And Harry says, Lupin could have killed me about 100 times already this year if he'd wanted to. Why wouldn't he? Don't ask me to fathom the mind of a werewolf, he says. Harry, you're pathetic. Not really the kind of thing you want to say to your teacher. You're pathetic just because they made a fool of you at school. You won't even listen. How does Harry know they made a fool of him at school? Just from what he's heard. Well, what's going to happen later on? We're going to see it. We're going to see it. And we're going to see it from whose perspective? Snape's. Okay. Harry doesn't really understand yet how bad his father and uh, Sirius were. Okay. Get out of the way, Potter. Harry made up his mind. Before Snape could even t take a step toward him, raised his wand which Ron and Hermione also say at the same time. Black, you shouldn't have done that. <laughs> Hermione's going, we attacked the teacher, we attacked the teacher, you know. So, they keep talking about scabbers. And Lupin asks, you know, Sirius, that's a fair question. How did you find out where he was? How did you find out he was. And he pulls out the newspaper, the Daily Prophet, that, where'd he get it from? When? When Fudge came to do his inspections. And Sirius asked him for the newspaper. Miss Crosswords, he said. Well, what's on the cover of the Daily Prophet? The Weasley sitting there at the Pyramids of Giza. You know, and in Ron's shirt pocket, or on his shoulder, I can't remember which, scabbers with the right foot, three, four, five toes, and the left foot, kind of like Frodo the nine-fingered, <laughs> scabbers. How did you get that? Then he goes on and explains. Black, he's got a toe missing. Of course. He cut it off himself just before he transformed. And so they keep talking, and Ron's like, you guys are still crazy. Okay. Um, page 365. Sirius explained what he meant when he said, I assume killed your parents. He said, I as good as killed them. I persuaded Lily and James to change to Peter at the last moment. Persuaded them to use him as secret keeper instead of me. I'm to blame. I know it. The night they died, I had arranged to check on Peter, make sure he was still safe. But when I arrived at his hiding place, he was gone. No sign of a struggle, he says. And I knew. It didn't feel right. So what did I do? I went to your house. And he gets there just when? when Hagrid's there rescuing little Harry. Okay. Ron, give me that rat. Ron's like, what are you going to do to him? Force him to show himself. And they make Peter Pettigrew transform. Serious. Remus. Old friends. Yeah, right. Okay. And they talk. And on page 368, Pettigrew talks about Sirius having dark powers the rest of us only can only dream of. 
you know. And Sirius uses Voldemort's name. Pettigrew flinched as though Black had brandished a whip at him. What? Scared to hear your old master's name? I don't blame you, Peter. His lot aren't very happy with you, are they? Don't know what you mean, Sirius. You haven't been hiding from me for 12 years. The servant of the Dark Lord will be set free. Okay? He'll be unbound after 12 years. Who's it talking about? The prophecy. Is it Peter? Or is there a way that it can be worked out that it's not Peter? But that it's Barty Crouch Jr. Just kind of hold that idea. You've been hiding from Voldemort's old supporters. I heard things in Azkaban, Peter. They think you're all dead or you'd have to answer to them. And he says, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm not a spy, etc., etc." And they keep talking, page 370. Peter says, you know, why would I do this? Why wouldn't I have hurt Harry before now? And Sirius says, I'll tell you why. Because you never did anything for anyone unless you could see what was in it for you. Okay? In other words, what would he gain? Voldemort's been in hiding for 15 years. They say he's half dead. Has he been in hiding for 15 years? How old's Harry in this book? Turns 11, turns 12, turns 13. Was he hiding for two years before Harry was born? Is that an error? They say he's half dead. You weren't about to commit murder right under Albus Dumbledore's nose. You'd, be one of, you'd want to be quite sure he was the biggest bully in the playground before you went back to him, wouldn't you? Why else did you find a wizard family to take you in? Okay. And then they ask Sirius, how did you not go crazy? What do the Dementors take away from you? Your happy thoughts, your cheer, your joy. Sirius says, I knew I was innocent. That wasn't a happy thought. Think about it. You get sentenced to prison for 12 years and you know you're innocent. Is that a happy thought? No, that's a thought that makes you really want to come out and do the crime for which you were committed. Double jeopardy can't be charged. Now, they don't have double jeopardy in Wizarding World. We do. If you get sent to jail for a murder that you didn't commit and the person you were supposed to have murdered isn't really dead, guess what? Legally, you can kill that person. Scott free and not go to jail because you've already been charged for that crime. Okay? I don't recommend doing that <laughs> for benefits of YouTube. <laughs> okay? So, Sirius explains and Harry remembered what Mr. Weasley had told Mrs. Weasley that Sirius kept saying he's at Hogwarts. <coughs> Sirius, it was as if, page 372, it was as if somebody had lit a fire in my head. The Dementors couldn't destroy it. It wasn't a happy feeling. It was an obsession. But it gave me strength. He says, one night they opened my door to bring food. I slipped past them as a dog. Harder for them to sense animal emotions. But they were confused. I was thin, very thin, thin enough to slip through the bars. Swam as a mainland. Journey north, slipped into the Hogwarts grounds as a dog. You fly as well as your father did, Harry. Believe me, believe me, Harry, I never betrayed James and Lily. I would have died before I betrayed them. Okay? And so finally, Lupin has to admit, and Black has to admit, they thought the other was guilty. Forgive me, Remus, says Black. Not at all, you in turn forgive me for believing you were the spy? Of course. Okay, now that they get that nicety over it, let's kill him, shall we? Okay. Ron, Ron, haven't I been a good friend to you? A good pet? You won't let them kill me, will you? Now think about this for a moment. Ron, who's had scabbers for however many years, 
We know Scabbers is old. We don't know when Percy gave him to him. Okay. Ron, I let you sleep in my bed. <laughs> so creepy. Yeah, really creepy. Kind boy, kind master. I was your rat. I was a good. Okay. Sweet girl, clever girl. You know, Hermione's like, where's Cookshanks? Yeah. <laughs> okay. And so finally, Peter Bredrigu turns to Harry. And Sirius says, how dare you speak to Harry? How dare you face him? How dare you talk about James in front of him? He, he would have shown me mercy. That is, James would have shown me mercy. They seize Pettigrew's shoulders. They throw him onto the floor. He twitches in terror. You sold James and Lily to Voldemort. Do you deny it? What could I have done? It's a fantastic scene. Not in the films, but... What could I have done? The Dark Lord, you have no idea. He has weapons you can't imagine. I was scared, Sirius. I was never brave. Like in Remus and James. What in the world ever allowed James and Sirius and Remus to have this loser be one of their group? I mean, think about this. Is there anything remotely redeeming about Peter Pettigrew? Is there anything about him that, that speaks the other three? No. He's short, he's pudgy, he's a slow learner in terms of learning the Animagus charm. I mean, listen to the conversation had at the Three Broomsticks by Fudge and, and Hagrid and Flitwick and Madame Rosmerta. And Madame Rosmerta says, you mean Peter Pettigrew, the little short pudgy one? He was never really up to their caliber. And yet they let him hang around, okay? I was never brave like you and Remus and James. I never meant it to happen. He forced me. Don't lie, you'd been passing information to him for a year before Lily and James died. You were his spy. He, he was taking over everywhere. What was to be gained by refusing him? Notice the calculus he went through in his mind. He, he, it's like he had a ledger sheet. Support Voldemort, support Lily and James. Deny Voldemort, deny Lily and James. Deny Voldemort, die. Deny Lily and James, live. <laughs> what would I have gotten out of it, he says. What was there to be gained? What was there to be gained by fighting the most evil that ever existed? Only innocent lives, Peter. Only innocent life. You don't understand. He would have killed me. Then you should have died. Died rather than betray your friends. As we would have done for you. Okay? We, 13 years ago, we would have died for you. We would have sacrificed ourselves for you. You should have realized, says Lupin, if Voldemort didn't kill you, we would. In other words, we have an even bigger score against you than Voldemort does. And Harry does what? He runs forward, places himself in front of Pettigrew, facing the wands. You can't kill him. Does he just run and say the trash cans, Peter? Does he do this? If you go to shield somebody from somebody else, what do you do? Yeah, you make yourself as big as possible. So he goes and stands in front and does this. What shape is he making? Okay. 
black, hairy, this piece of vermin is the reason for parents. This cring I got you just gotta really love serious. This cringing bit of filth would have seen you die too without turning a hair. I know. We'll take him up to the castle. We'll hand him over to the Dementors. Don't kill him. Oh, it's more than I deserve. You know, Harry, get off me. He says, I'm not doing it for you. I'm doing it because I don't reckon my dad would have wanted them to become killers. Just for you. That's kind of like saying, you're beneath them. You're not worth them becoming murderers. Okay? Serious. Well, you're the only one to decide, Harry. Go back to Gandalf. Does Harry have the right to decide? Many that live deserve death, and some that die deserve life. Can you give it back to them? Then be not too eager to deal out death in judgment, for even the very wise cannot see all ends. And my heart tells me that the pity and mercy of Bilbo will rule the fate of many, yours not least. Okay? The pity and mercy of Fro the pity and mercy of Harry will also rule the fate of many. Harry's not least. Okay? So they tie him up, and they start to make their way back up, and they bring Snape. And you gotta, again, just love Sirius, because... Notice he's got Snape, you know, in the mobile corpus thing, and he's But what happens? His head bangs the steps as they go up the stairs. <coughs> okay. And what does Harry learn from Sirius himself as they're making their way? I'm your godfather. If you wanted to, I would, but, you know, you could come live with me if you wanted. Harry now has a happy thought, a really happy thought. Make making Patronuses pretty easy, because what's the happy thought? To never, to to go, to Jersey. To never <laughs> go home to the Dursleys. That is a happy thought. What else is it, though, even more than that? He has a parent. He has a father figure. It's not his father. It's his father's best friend who's been locked up in prison for 12 years for murder. Kind of skating on the edge of sanity. Okay. And the moon shows itself and Lupin goes all crazy. And the Dementors come. Harry sees the flashing blind, blinding light. And he discovers himself back in the castle. Okay. We get the chapter Hermione's secret. Dumbledore comes in and explains exactly what Lupin is saying, what Lupin and Sirius Black are saying, that it does match exactly Harry's story. Okay. And... Snape refers to this story, page 390. Fairy tale. I suppose he's told you the same fairy tale he's planted in Potter's mind. Something about a rat and Pettigrew being alive. He goes, yeah, yeah. Okay. Could they prove about Pettigrew? What would possibly be one way. The pensive. Veritaserum. Missing finger. <laughs> Marauder's map. If he was still on Hogwarts grounds, because that's all it shows. Okay. But they don't do any of those things. Why not? because the pensive doesn't show up until book four. 
Vera Tessera. Four. In other words, all these little plot devices that come up later, she doesn't introduce them yet. But when once they come up later, they then require you to say, yeah, but why couldn't they have used that earlier? And since obviously they had them, what, what allows for the rescue here? And I don't mean Harry's Patronus. What allows for Harry to be able to even be there to conjure up the Patronus? The time turner. Okay. Keep going with the time turner. What's the problem of the time turner? Okay. Voldemort tells Voldemort. Dumbledore tells Hermione, you know, three turns, I think we'll do it. Well, three turns takes them how far back? Like six hours. Okay. So how many turns would you need to take to go back to Tom River meeting Meropay and just stop it? Just stop Voldemort from ever being born. Stop Voldemort from ever being conceived. Or heck, for why not go back a thousand years and stop the division from ever beginning between Slytherin and Gryffindor? You have a time turner. You can go back. Why not go all the way back to the beginning, to the first oops, and make the first person who said, person who said oops not do the oops. The time turner is a idiotic device. It is a plot device that allows an author to get out of a problem that the author has created. Okay. It introduces that here. You can think of multiple situations later on where somebody could say McGonagall for the time turner so we can take care of X, Y, or Z problem. I mean, book four. Let's go back to the maze. No, Cedric, really, you don't want to touch this. Port key. You figured Voldemort would already have gotten it if there was one out there. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah, I shouldn't have killed Harry. No. Shouldn't have killed his mother. Should have taken her and given her to, you know, Snape. Or should have stopped Dumbledore from being born. I mean... If the good guys can have one, why can't the bad guys? Okay, you see the problem? And it's the problem. It's I'm not saying this is, you know, it's the problem of every time travel narrative. If you can change one thing in history, you can change everything in history. Okay? So why not? Why not rid the world of evil? No more bad grades, no more hunger, no more poverty, no more pollution. Everything would be hunky dory. Okay? So, <clears throat> Dumbledore does tell um, Hermione what to do. Page 391. Snape whispers to Dumbledore, You surely don't believe a word. Book five, what is Snape? What is Snape adept at? Let me put it that way. Occlumency, okay? Which must also mean, if he's adept at occlumency, what else should he also be adept at? Legilimency or legilimency, however you pronounce it. So if he's an accomplished Legilimens, or Legilimens, what should he be able to do? No 
one is telling the truth or not. Even if he can't tell what, if Sirius is telling the truth, whether or not Harry is? Yeah. Okay. Should he trust Dumbledore? Not even throw seeing occlumency out, out the door? Should he trust Dumbledore? At this point? Dumbledore already done. <laughs> Trusted him. Okay. And yet he doesn't. Sirius Black showed he is capable of murder at the age of 16. You haven't forgotten that, Headmaster. You haven't forgotten that he once tried to kill me. Have memories as good as it ever was, Severus. What does that mean? I also remember something else, Severus. It's because of you that Harry Potter is here alone. You told Voldemort about his parents, or excuse me, about the prophecy. Okay? So, Dumbledore tells them about the, uh, what to do, and they go back in time, Buckbeak, and page 406, Harry and Hermione are talking, whoever it was that cast the Patronus, and Hermione says, but it must have been a really powerful wizard to drive all those Dementors away. If the Patronus was shining so brightly, didn't it light him up? Couldn't you see? Harry, yeah, I saw him, but I, I, I was delirious. I, I passed out. Who do you think it was? I, I thought it was my dad. Harry, your dad's dead. Like, you, come back to me, Harry. You're off in La La Land. I know. You think you saw his ghost? No, he looked solid, but maybe I was seeing things. I know, it sounds crazy. Was it impossible that his father had come back? What is it impossible? Ghosts? Yeah. There's the fat friar and the bloody baron and a few others. Page 411. Harry's looking across the lake. He sees himself and Hermione. He sees the Dementors. No one's coming. And then it hit him. He understood. He didn't see his father. He saw himself. Okay. Wait, pause. How did he see himself? Problem of time travel again. Here's the stream of time. Here he's at the lake. He sees the Patronus. And he passes out. Time goes by. Here they are. They go back in time. Okay. When it first occurs, this is where, you know, talking about time and time travel going, because it's completely illogical. When it first occurs, has this occurred? No. No. Yeah. Because what problem do you run into? This becomes a cycle, a never ending cycle, which would kind of imply that at either this point or this point, there's no going on. Because Harry's always going to be either here or here. So just don't think about it too much. <laughs> yeah, your head will go. <laughs> so um, I lost my place. Here he sees himself. He does expect a Patronum. The Patronus does. Hermione goes, what did you do? I saved our lives. She goes, oh, no, you changed the flow of history. Haven't you been listening? Hermione doesn't have a clue because she thinks everything is really linear, okay? 
Uh, they say serious. Notice page 419. Snape says it's all Potter's fault. He gets away with everything. Fudge is like, what are you talking about? Potter's been here the whole time. Okay. Fudge leaves. Lupin leaves. Lupin says, you know, resigned because Snape let slip that he was a werewolf. Um, tells him about his father's nickname, Prongs, that he always appeared as a stag and such. And after Lupin leaves, Dumbledore. On page 425. Notice now in the first three books, we get this, we usually call it a debriefing session, okay, where Dumbledore takes Harry aside to essentially explain to him what the real meaning of everything that's happened in the story is, or to give us the moral of that individual novel. Every novel doesn't have one, okay, but most of them do. Even book seven does. It's called King's Cross. Okay. So Harry says at the bottom of 425, it didn't make any difference. That is, saving Sirius's life. Drew got away. Dumbledore's what? What do you mean it didn't make any difference? It made all the difference in the world. You saved an innocent terrible fate. And Harry goes, oh, terrible. That reminds me. And he tells Dumbledore about the prophecy. She said the servant would help him back to power. Then she sort of became normal again. Couldn't remember anything she'd said. He says, was she a real prediction? He says, you know, Harry, I think she was. And that brings her real predictions to two. I should give her a raise. <laughs> Harry, okay. And I stopped serious and Professor Notice. Professor Lupin. He's not a professor anymore. He resigned. So Harry gives him the dignity of calling him professor. From killing Pettigrew, that makes it my fault if Voldemort comes back. Notice what Harry is saying here. I saved, uh, no, I stopped. Pettigrew's death, okay, that's premise one, premise one, Pettigrew uh, restores Voldy, premise three, couldn't restore Voldy if not for me. Therefore, I restored Voldy. What's the flaw in his argument? Pettigrew had a choice. It goes back to the end of book two. What does Pettigrew have to teach Harry at the end of book two? There's no good and bad, there's just choices. Uh, no. You got half of that right. Okay. Not that there's no good and bad part. Harry says at the end of book two, okay, then I should have been in Slytherin. If there's a bit of Voldemort in me, he takes that to mean, then I must be, to use Hagrid's words, rotten to the core. Okay? Because I have these abilities. Dumbledore teaches Harry what? It is our choices, Harry, far more than our abilities that show what we truly are. Choices, not abilities, not inbred natural talents. OK? 
Okay? Harry in this is taking Peter Pettigrew's choice away. He is saying, if Voldemort comes back to power, because Peter, grew, Peter Pettigrew helps him, I'm responsible. No, he's not. If Voldemort comes back to power because Peter Pettigrew helps him, who's responsible? Peter Pettigrew. Harry's only responsible for letting Peter Pettigrew live. He is not, therefore, responsible for every act of choice Peter Pettigrew makes. Just like I am not responsible for every action and choice my children make. Or your parents are not responsible for every choice and action you make. Okay? Which is why Dumbledore says, Hasn't your experience with the Time Turner taught you anything? It's not really a good question because the whole experience of the Time Turner could make one shoot themselves. <laughs> the consequences of our actions are always so complicated, so diverse, that predicting the future is a very difficult business indeed. Because when you make a choice and you act upon it, you do something, do you know what the consequences are? No. You might know what some are. For example... If you pull the trigger of a loaded weapon and it is pointed at somebody, you know what one of the consequences will be. You will be shot. They may or may not die, depending on where it is pointed at them. If you're pointing it at their big toe, they're not going to die. If you point it at their nose, they will. Okay. But the consequences do what from that point? They ripple outward. Okay? It's not like a direct, you know, from here to here. Think of it as, you know, a rack of pool balls, billiard balls set up, and you take that pool cue and you hit that rack of balls. What's it do? You don't know. You don't know where those balls are going to end up when you hit them. Some will end up over here, some will end up over here, some will... But you don't know exactly. Similarly, we don't know what the consequences of all our actions will be. So he says, Trelawney's proof of that. You did a noble thing, Harry, in saving Pettigrew's life. Yeah, but if he helps Voldemort back to power, Pettigrew owes his life to you. You've sent Voldemort a deputy who is in your debt. In other words, that debt will have to be paid. When one wizard saves another wizard's life, it creates a certain bond between them. Well, oh, nice little bit of lawmaking there. This is a wizarding law, so to speak. Not something passed by the Ministry of Magic. Dumbledore is saying this is an existential law that exists. All right? And I'm much mistaken if Voldemort wants his servant in the debt of Harry Potter. In other words, come hell or high water, before Peter Pettigrew takes his death breath, the bond will be paid. The debt will be paid somehow. Harry, I don't want to Pettigrew, slimy little git. I don't want anything to do with him. Too bad. This is magic at its deepest. Kind of like, if you're familiar with Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe, magic before the dawn of time. Okay? Magic at its deepest, its most impenetrable. Notice what kind of magic it is not. It's not magic that comes at the end of a wand. It's not magic that is dependent upon how you pronounce certain syllables. It's not magic that comes as a result of a potion. What kind of magic is it? The relationship of two people. That's magic. That's real magic. Two people relating. Two people coming together. Breaking out of their boundaries. Breaking out of their boxes. Did Harry have to save Peter Pettigrew? No. But he did. Why? Because
because he thought murder was wrong. He stepped in the gap between Pettigrew and Sirius and Lupin. Okay. What does he also do in doing that? It's a bond with Sirius and Lupin. He kind of becomes the third wheel or the third leg, the second coming of James Potter, almost. At least that's what Molly Weasley's going to say. Okay. And then Dumbledore says, your father would have done the same thing. After all, what did we see his father do? He saved Snape. He hated Snape's guts. He detested Snape. Snape to get killed by a werewolf. That would be horrible. And not just for the particular werewolf involved. Harry, I, I, I thought it was my dad who conjured that Patronus. Easy mistake. You do look like James, except for your eyes. I know it was, he's dead. You think the dead we loved ever truly leave us? You really think that, Harry? You think we more clearly than ever in times of great trouble? Okay. How much would Harry have recalled them? Have recalled James? If it hadn't been for the anti-Dementors lessons, would he have ever heard James's voice? Your father is alive in you, Harry. Shows himself most plainly when you have need of him. All kind of sappy, touchy-feely. Oh, they're not really dead, Harry. They're alive in you. Just look inwardly, you know. That a little bit in the book four, I think. How else could you produce that particular Patronus? Prongs rode again last night. How else could he produce that Patronus? He is the son of James Potter. He's the heir, as it were. Okay. Last night, series told me about how they became animagi. An extraordinary achievement, not least keeping it quiet. Think about that for a moment. Dumbledore appears like God in the novel. He knows everything that goes on. No, apparently not. Okay. And then I remember the most unusual form your Patronus took when it charged Mr. Malfoy at your Quidditch match against Ravenclaw. You know, you did see your father last night. You found him inside yourself. So when Harry looked in the mirror and saw all of his family... Was he really looking deep inside and seeing that he's not alone? Okay, it's kind of a rhetorical question. I don't know the answer. So, very almost to the end of the pay, end of the novel. The next day, they're talking about you know who's going to be the new defense against the dark arts class teacher. And Dean Thomas says maybe a vampire. No, that's going to have to wait couple more books. Um, Harry gets the note from Sirius about the Hogsmeade vacations. And that book ends and we start Goblet of Fire. Which I hope you bought, but if you didn't, that's fine. Now, what happened between books and Goblet of Fire? <clears throat> Midnight release is what happened. Okay. Publication of book one, book two, book three. This was 99, I believe. And then uh, one year for this, this was 99 in the paperback version. It was 98 in the hardback version. This was 2000 in the hardback version. Um, two years, 
between book three and book four, okay? Also with the advent of book four was when you first saw Amazon pre-orders, where this book became the best-selling book in history before we had a copy in their hands. Just kind of mind-boggling how that could work. Okay. And what do we, how does the novel open? Where does the novel open? It's like past the birthday, isn't it? Yes. Yes. What else? Where is it not? It's not number four, Privet Drive. Okay. One through three all start at number four, Privet Drive. This one doesn't. And I think there's a couple of reasons for that. One, Rowling is trying to show her audience, her readers, there isn't a set formula. You might have thought there was a set formula that every book would be Harry starting at home, going off to Hogwarts, overcoming some problem at Hogwarts, solving some mystery, being victorious at the end and everything ending happily ever after. Okay. Well, this one she's going to say it's a little bit different because not only do we start with the old man, Frank Bryce, but what else? Well, actually, literally, um, even start with the old. What do we start with? <coughs> the villagers of Little Hangleton still called it the Riddle House, even though it had been many years since they had lived there. The house was creepy. Half a century ago, something strange and horrible had happened there, something that the old the inhabitants of the village still like to discuss. Okay? And they talk about the riddles being discovered dead. In the middle of their drawing room, lying on the ground, spread eagle, eyes wide open. Okay? And they talk about Frank Bryce, who has been arrested. This was 50 years in the past. He was the gardener, blah, 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 blah. Then we come up to the present, page four. And now we're taken to Frank Bryce, an elderly gentleman. He's in his 70s, all right? He's got a bad leg and it wakes him up. And he sees from where he's been sleeping in the gardener's shed, his home, up at the big house, there's a light in the window, and it looks like firelight. And he thinks some kids have broken in and lit a fire in the rooms. And notice he goes to the house. Page 6. Frank limped around to the back of the house until he reached a door almost completely hidden by ivy. So the door is almost covered. He takes out the old key, puts it into the lock, and open the door noiselessly. How long has this door been closed? A long time. How long do we know? Maybe 50 years. Long enough for Ivy to almost cover the door opening. In other words, that's longer than a year. I used to have Ivy growing on the side of one of my... That Ivy took about 15 to 20 years to cover that. It's been closed a long time. Have you ever opened a door that's been shut for a long time? First of all, they're almost impossible to open because they seal. Okay? Because of rain and the weather. The door swells with rain and such. What else? The lock has been secured. He the key in the lock and he turns the lock without any problem. No. When I was in college, I worked in the uh, maintenance office, and one of the things we had to do periodically was go around to every building on campus with graphite and squirt it in lock opening to make sure the keys were turned properly without any problem. 
also think of those old like skull keys and stuff like click. Exactly. And then he opens the door without any creaking of the hinges? Not likely. Unless Frank is a really good caretaker and he oils the hinges regularly. In which case you would think he'd probably remove all the ivy away from the door. Just a little problem there. So he goes in. He hears these voices. Wormtail. My lord speaking. And we hear Wormtail say it could be done without Harry Potter, my lord. Without Harry Potter. I do not say this out of concern for the boy. Liar, liar, pants on fire. The boy is nothing to me. Liar. Any wizard, any wizard could do. Is that true? Yes, it is. But any wizard could do actual curse that will be used to revive Voldemort. But not any wizard will do for what Voldemort really wants. Okay? Has to be the blood of Harry Potter, which we'll see a little bit later. So they keep talking, and Voldemort says, your devotion to me is nothing but a sham, blah, 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 blah. And <clears throat> Wormtail says, I am a faithful servant, page 10. He says, Wormtail, I need somebody with brains. Somebody has never wavered. You, unfortunately, fulfill neither requirement. Man, that's thanks for you. <laughs> I found you. I was the one who found you. I brought you Bertha Jorkins. Well, that's true. Stroke of brilliance. Couldn't have thought possible from you, but, you know, you did. Okay. So Wormtail thinks you're going to kill me too? Page 11. Why would I kill you? I killed Bertha because I had to. She was fit for nothing after my question. Quite useless. Unless, of course, the ministry found her, in which case there could be problems. So Frank shows up. And Lord Voldemort tells Wormtail to invite the old gentleman in. Frank, you heard everything, Muggle? What's that you're calling me? I'm calling you a Muggle. It means you're not a wizard. I don't know a wizard. All I've known, all I know is I've heard enough to interest the police tonight. My wife knows I'm up here. You have no wife. Nobody knows you are here. You told no that you were coming. Do not lie to Lord Voldemort. Why? Because I'm a little gentleman, so I can read your mind. You know, all that kind of stuff. Okay? So Frank Bryce says, turn around and face me like a man. Okay, but I'm not a man, so, you know. So Frank turns him around, excuse me, Wormtail turns him around, and we're told Frank saw what was sitting in it. His walking stick fell to the floor. He opened his mouth and let out a scream Vodacadabra. What is it Frank sees? Why does he scream? It's the stunted baby thing. Stunted baby thing. <laughs> it's, a... it's an abomination. It's what Harry sees under the seat in the chapter King's Cross in Book 7. When he thinks, I ought to try to help it. And Dumbledore tells him, it's beyond help. Okay? That is the spiritual reality of what is physically here. Okay? It is, the captain said, a stunted, deformed, baby-like thing. Abomination. Obviously, it has a mouth and can speak. Okay? Mm -hmm. And it can hold a wand. No what with necessarily, but it can hold a wand. But 200 miles away, Harry wakes up. And his scar is hurting. And he's thinking of this dream. And then he starts to think, hmm, I had a dream. What does this dream mean? Why does my scar hurt? Let's see, what would my friends think? Hermione would say, ooh, that's really serious. Write to Dumbledore. Look in a book. 
Only problem is, how many people have scars from Avada Kedavra curses? So many comments about them. So Harry thinks, okay, what am I going to write to Dumbledore? Hmm, page 21. Sorry to bother you on all that, old boy, but my scar hurt this morning. No? <laughs> no, that won't really work. Okay, so he thinks, uh, I'll write to Ron. What will Ron say? Well, you know who can't be near him. I mean, you know, wouldn't you? He'd be trying to do you in a good, wouldn't he? That's it, Ron. Be ever cheerful and positive and hopeful, you know. Maybe Kurt will always twinge a bit. Except, for, of course, for those that always kill the people that receive them. So he thinks, no. Sirius, yeah, all right to Sirius. My psychotic, murdering godfather. And he writes to Sirius and tells him, Dudley's diet isn't going too well. Page 25. My aunt found him smuggling donuts into his room yesterday. They told him they'd have to cut his pocket money if he keeps doing it. So he got really angry and chucked his PlayStation out of the window. Way to go, Dudley. That's a responsible thing to do. It's a stupider thing you can play games on. Bit stupid, really. Now he hasn't even got Mega Mutilation Part 3 to take his mind off of things. I'm okay, but my scar hurt last night. Don't know if it hurt, or don't know if it means anything. Meanwhile, say hello to Buckbeak. Goodbye. <laughs> and then he gets an invitation from Ron, page, uh, the chapter of the invitation. What are we told about Dudley here? Page 27. Dudley's gotten his report card from school. Okay. Accusations of bullying in the report and such. Aunt Petunia, he's boisterous. Yeah, that's, that's an explanation. <clears throat> like the creeps who raped the girl in Steubenville, uh, Ohio. You know, they're just boys being boys. Okay. Dudley had reached roughly the size and weight of a young killer whale. Yeah, he's just boisterous, though. Um... So here he gets the letter, and he reads it, and Mrs. Weasley hopes she put enough stamps on. How many stamps did she put on the envelope? You have to cover, it. cover it all but one square inch where she wrote the address. Okay, that's a lot of stamps. <clears throat> so Harry asks, you know, can we go, and Vernon essentially says, yes. As long as you don't mention the unnaturalness, you know, under my roof and stuff. He gets a letter back from Ron. I'm, free, I'm skipping. So, the Weasleys come to take Harry. And how do they come? Flying Fort Anglia, you know, swoops down Privet Drive. They apparate onto the front steps. No, so I've not seen before. Flu powder. Only thing is, did he see it? Did he use it in book two? Yeah, yeah okay, that's right. right. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, <coughs> the problem. They closed up their flu, so they're in the wall. So Mr. Weasley blows up the wall. Uh, page forty-four. Uh, yeah, sorry about that. It's all my fault. It just didn't occur to me that we wouldn't be able to get out at the other end. He's connected to the flu network, you see, just for an afternoon. Afternoon, He goes, um, I can put it right in a jiffy, though. Don't worry. I'll fire, light a fire to see, and I can repair your fire, fireplace before I disapparate. Okay. So the boys help Harry get his trunk and everything. Mr. Weasley's acting like, you know, nothing's gone wrong. Rubble all over the living room, you know, chalk dust and drywall dust all over. And uh, Mr. Weasley asks Dudley, having a good holiday, Dudley whimpers, holds his hands behind his back. He's afraid, you know, might get another tail. Fred and George kind of chuckle. So they go off, but they spill a bag of sweets. 
So George into the trunk. And Harry gets ready to go. Harry says, well, bye then. Moves towards the fire. And Mr. Weasley stops him. Harry said goodbye to you. Didn't you hear him? Harry, it doesn't matter. I honestly don't care. But it matters to Mr. Weasley. Why? Trey. What's he trying to do? He's trying to teach the Dursley something. And J.K. Rowling is trying to teach her audience something. Manners. Consideration. It is only considerate when you leave someone that you've been around for a long time, like a summer or a few months, to say goodbye. It is inconsiderate to just walk out the door like you don't owe them anything. Okay? Mr. We move Harry's hand from his shoulder because it matters to him. You aren't going to see your nephew till next summer. Surely you're going to say goodbye. <clears throat> Uncle Vernon's face, we're told, works furiously. In other words, he's like, who the blankety blank do you think you blew up my house? And you're trying to teach me manners? You're trying to teach me consideration? The idea of being taught consideration by a man who just blasted away half his living room wall seemed to be causing him intense suffering. Goodbye, then. See you. And suddenly, Dudley is kneeling and his tongue is growing. And Mr. Weasley says, don't worry, I can sort him out. Okay. No, really, it's a simple process. It was the toffee, friend, son Fred, practical joker, blah, blah, blah. Okay. And she, Mrs. You know, Dursley starts throwing stuff at him, at him. So they get back, and immediately, Fred, did he eat it? Yes, obviously, he's Dudley. Because... <clears throat> told them about Dudley's diet. So they knew, put sweets in front of Dudley, and it's like a moth to a campfire. <laughs> Mr. Weasley, that wasn't funny, Fred. And notice what he's doing almost as he says it. He's really almost chuckling. Okay, Fred, I, I didn't give him anything. I dropped it. You dropped it on purpose. You knew he needed it. You knew he's on a diet. How big did his tongue get? Four feet long before his parents would let me shriek it, okay? And then Mrs. Weasley comes in. Mr. Weasley is the pushover. He's, he's you know, a kitty cat compared to her. She's a Bengal tiger. She'll rip your heart out. <coughs> you wait until I tell your mother, tell me what? Oh, hello, Harry dear, tell me what? Nothing. <laughs> Okay. <clears throat> so, they get their owls. I'm skipping a bunch. <clears throat> and we find out about Fred and George's, you know, practical jokes. And Mrs. Weasley doesn't like them. They take the Quidditch World Cup, and we meet Bagman and Crouch. That chapter, Bagman and Crouch. Um... What do we know about Crouch from Percy? Real stuffy. Stunning, <laughs> stuffy, <laughs> brilliant wizard. What else? Percy's in love with him. I mean, for lack of a better phrase, Percy's in love with him. He's everything Percy wants to be. He's a rule follower. Okay. Knows multiple languages. And they make their way to the campgrounds. They walk by, you know, little children. Children stealing daddy's wand, you know, making slugs get big and small and big and small and popular. Wonderful stuff. <clears throat> 
Uh, they meet up with old friends, Seamus Finnegan and such. Let's see here. They get to their tent, and then they meet Ludo Bagman. Ludo's the guy in charge of magical sport and such. What did Ludo used to do? He used to play, play Quidditch. Used to play Quidditch professionally. Okay. What position? Beater. Why Ludo a beater? Why not seeker? Yeah, he's big and stocky, not necessarily fast. Okay. Why else? What's happened maybe once too many times? He got hit in the head. Okay, by a bludger. This kind of shows what the are good at. They can take a beating as well as give one. Who plays beaters for Gryffindor? Fred and George. Okay, just kind of you know. Keep the sides there. Ron is tall and lanky. Fred and George are short and squat. I don't mean squat fat. I mean they're muscular. Okay? But they can take a licking. Harry is short and lanky. Um, we hear all the bagmen and such. And then we get the actual Quidditch World Cup. We meet the Vila or see the Vila. And before them, Harry sees an house elf on page 97. Harry goes, Dobby? Did Sarah just call me Dobby? Uh, Harry says, sorry, thought you were someone else. But I know Dobby, sir. My name is Winky, sir. Y you, Shirley. Yes, I am. Dobby talks of you all the time. How is he? How's freedom suiting him? Oh, sir, I'm so many no disrespect, sir, but I was not sure you did. Sir, when you were setting him free, why? Ideas above his station. Can't get another position. Meaning he can't be a slave. Why not? He's one you didn't pay for his work. Harry, well, why shouldn't he be paid? <gasps> that was okay. So Harry wants to know why Winky's there, and Hinky doesn't. Winky doesn't really Hinky. <laughs> Oh, Winky. <clears throat> Winky doesn't say. She's just holding Master's seat. Um, and then what happens? As you're getting ready for the Quidditch match to begin, the Malfoys come up with Fudge and the Bulgarian wizard um, minister of magic. And Bottom of 100. Harry and Draco had been enemies ever since their very first journey to Hogwarts. Pale boy with a pointed face, white blonde hair, resembled his father. His mother was blonde too. Tall, slim. She would have been nice looking. If she hadn't been wearing a look that suggested there was a nasty under her nose. In other words, it's like she always goes around like this. With her face all scrunched up. Okay. And Fudge introduces... Um, them, how are you? I don't think you've met my wife Narcissa or our son Draco, Malfoy says to Fudge. How do you do? How do you do? And he introduces them to Mr. Obolonsky, the Bulgarian minister. And then Malfoy sees Arthur Weasley. What happened when they last met? Yeah, they got in a fight in Flourish and Blotts and Hagrid had to break it up. Good Lord, what did you have to sell to get seats in the top box? Surely your house wouldn't have fetched this much. Okay. In other words, these seats are worth more than you have. Fudge says, Lucius has just given a very generous contribution to St. Mungo's Hospital for injuries and injuries. Arthur, he's here as my guest. So what did Malfoy do to get... He made a political donation. Yeah, it was to the hospital, but it's a political donation. How politics work? Weasley, how nice. Okay. Harry realizes this is a sticky situation. Ron just says, slimy gets. Just have to love Ron. And come out. 
Ron nearly falls out of his seat. Hermione about wants to kill him. And what do we see? We see the various, the two teams, the Bulgarians and the Irish. And we see that a particular Bulgarian, Victor Crum, can fly really well. But he can't fly well enough to win the match on his own. So he loses the match on his own. Okay? How does he do it? Catches the golden snitch. <clears throat> so the match ends. And then a crowd of wizards start acting crazy, let's say. Page 119. Something strange is going on. And here he sees... A crowd of wizards, tightly packed, moving together with wands, pointing forward, marching slowly across the field. He realizes the heads are covered in masks, and then high above them he sees floating there four struggling figures, contorted into grotesque shapes, and he realizes the figures are the Roberts family, the Scottish family who owned the land on which the Quidditch um, match has been played. Mr. and Mrs. Roberts and their two children. And they're being held up in the air, high up in the air, and they're being turned around, and their bodies being contorted by the people down below their wands in the air. And Harry thinks, that's weird. Ron, page 120, that's sick. That is really sick. And yet, what are the people wearing the hoods doing as holding their wands up? Laughing and shouting. For them, this is fun. Okay? Mr. Weasley tells Ron, Harry, and Hermione to go to the edge of the woods. Okay? Ron trips over a root, falls, Draco makes a Smart remark. Ron says something that can't be printed. We don't know why. And Draco says, you better get her away. That is, you better hide Hermione. Hermione, what's that supposed to mean? Page 122. Granger, they're after muggles. Do you want to be showing off your knickers in midair? Because if you do, hang around. They're moving this way. Harry, Hermione's a witch. Have it your own way, Potter. If you think they can't spot a mud, stay where you are. Ron, he heard that word again. He's ready to, you know, watch your mouth. Never mind, Ron, says Hermione. They go off deeper into the woods. Okay. And they're looking for Fred and George. He realizes he's lost his wand. And he thinks maybe it's back in the tent. Hermione says, maybe it fell out of, our po out of your pocket when you were running. Harry's thinking, yeah, maybe. And he's trying to think when he last had it. And he runs into Winky. There was bad wizards about. People here, Winky's getting out of the way. And what do they suddenly hear? Okay. Bagman comes in. They hear Mord Mordre. And they look up and they see the skull in the sky, the green skull with the snake coming out of its mouth. Harry doesn't know what it is, but Hermione does. It's the talk, page 129. You know who Voldemort's? Harry, come on. Harry whirled around and in an instant he registered one fact. Each of these wizards, these guys who had apparated around them, had his wand out, and every wand was pointing right at himself, Ron and Hermione. And without pausing to think, he yelled, Duck! He pulls them down. Okay. What does this show us on Harry's part? Good reflex. He acts without having to think. Okay. Because Harry and Ron, uh, Hermione and Ron would have been done what? They'd have been standing, and they would have been stupefied by 
15, 20 fully qualified wizards? How stupefied have you been? Really stupefied. Okay? Or stupidified, maybe. So, so in the remainder of that chapter, who is accused of having conjured a dark mark? First, and then Winky. But whose voice did Harry, Hermione, and Ron hear? Not Winky's. It wasn't a high voice. It didn't say, oh, my smart man. No, it was a deep voice. And they said it was a deep voice. So who goes off to see what might be in the underbrush? But he doesn't find anything, apparently. He comes back. And who starts leveling accusations? This is important. Amos Diggory. So Barty Crouch kind of takes a little bit of a frontry at this and says, haven't I proven myself to the Do I really need to prove that I am against the dark mark and against dark magic? You know, there's only two people, he says, in this forest who have really shown what they have to do with dark magic. One of them has a scar on his head, and the other's me. Now, Harry doesn't understand what is being talked about. He doesn't find out till later. How badly does Barty Crouch Jr. hate dark magic? Uh, sorry, Barty Crouch Sr. He's the son up the river. That's how badly. That doesn't find that out till much later. Okay? So when they go back to the Weasley's tent, the minute or so we have left. Um, Mr. Weasley kind of explains uh, actually he doesn't explain that there I'll, um, later. we'll stop there I want to pick up when we come back with about page 140. So we can hear Percy sing Barty Crouch's praises and what Hermione has to say about that.